Hello, woman beings. I am so excited to introduce today's episode to you. We are meeting with the legend Linda K. Klein. She's an author. She is the founder and president of Break Free Together, and she is a purity culture recovery and deconstruction coach. Um, we're going to talk all the more about all of those things. But Linda, first of all, thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor. Thank you so much for having me. I, I don't know that I've ever been called a legend before, so this might be my best <laughs> intro ever. <laughs> well, you're a legend to me and a legend to us. And um, with all that being said, we're just going to dive right in. This is Woman Being, where we explore thoughts and opinions and have the freedom to change our minds. Without expectation or judgment, we will hold a safe space and support each other as we navigate together in the form of feminine. So for those of you who do not know Linda K. Klein, we reviewed her book actually earlier this season. It was at the beginning Last, of season, beginning season? season two. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, that we reviewed Pure. Um, this book has been hugely impactful to me. I would highly recommend anyone to go back and listen to that episode if you want to hear more about Pure. But um, essentially, and Linda will tell us all the more information about this, but essentially she spent 10 years interviewing and researching purity culture and its effects um, and wrote a book about it. And the findings that she brings forward are um, eye-opening mm-hmm. and incredible. But um, I'll read the tagline again. I did this in our review episode, but I think it wraps it up nicely. It's inside the evangelical movement that shamed a generation of young women and how I broke free. And so... Definitely check out this book. Definitely check out that episode. And while you're at it, um, you could follow us on Instagram. You could give us a review on Apple Podcasts. And you could subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or whatever podcast platform you like listening to. And that would do us a huge favor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you can. (laughs) Um, oh, yeah. Also, Emma and Kellyanne are joined with me today, as always. <laughs> Welcome, yes, ladies. I'm here. so glad here you're here. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Happy to be here. Didn't mean to ignore you at the top there. That's um, okay. It's and, all about Linda today. It's yeah. all about Linda it's all about today. Linda. It's um, Linda Sunday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Linda, uh, as we've said, this book has been incredibly impactful for me, for us. Um, I think a lot of people really appreciated that episode where we reviewed your book and talked about it. Um, first question for you is what made you want to start writing Pure? Like, how, how did you get inspired to bring this book together? Well, I mean, it's interesting. Um, first of all, I heard you say I've been working on this for a decade, which I think is probably something that I said somewhere, maybe even in the book. At this point, it's now been two decades. It's been two decades. Oh, wow. So I, which is completely, is that true? I did the math the other day. <laughs> and I started, I started when I was um, 26. Um, so it's been almost wow. two decades. I'm 43 now. Um, wow. So, so you know, so this is a long-standing project. I think when I wrote the book, it was it had been 10 years of research, um, and then you know mm-hmm. and then the work continued, right? Um, but but the but the work for me started before that, right? For me, this all started when yeah. I left the Evangelical Christian Church. And, uh, un, you know, unaware at that point what exactly I had grown up in, in the evangelical church. I didn't recognize that there was such a thing as purity culture. None of us did. That word didn't exist, right? Um, and I certainly didn't recognize that I had been one of the first adolescents to have grown up within it. This grand experiment, um, you know, that that it was kind of based on a hunch <laughs> that if we could shame young hmm. people into utterly suppressing all sexual thought and sexual feeling and sexual choices and inspiring sexual thoughts or feelings or choices in others via how we walk or talk or dress, if we could get people to push all that down, then the theory went, right? You know, we would protect young people from the AIDS crisis that was going on, from the other STIs, from the teen pregnancy that people were really scared about um, at this time in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and then, as the theory went, right, they would get married in their 
heterosexual marriage and flip that sexuality on like a light switch and everything would be fine and everyone would be safe. Um, and by the way, there would be no mm. sexual violence because no nobody would be inspiring, quote unquote, sexual violence by the way they walk or talk or dress, right? Um, so yeah. obviously highly problematic view of sexual violence that categorizes it as sex rather than violence. All this to say, you know, here I was a, a 20 year old, right? Having grown up in this purity culture experiment, completely uh, unaware, right? When I grew up in purity culture, I just thought that this was the way the world worked and that I was being taught truth um, the way the world was, or at least the way that, that God wanted the world to be and the way that if the world were, uh, that everything would work out for the best for everyone. Um, when I started to really doubt that and question that, um, broadly speaking, and especially for myself, I left the church, though. I thought that I was going to be suddenly free, right? that I would be able to now hmm. live in alignment with the new perspective that I had on life and on my body and on my um, human, <laughs> human sexual nature. Um, and what I discovered is that actually the intensity of the experience that I had growing up in purity culture had so deeply shaped my sexual development at such a critical time, right? Adolescence is when we are developing a sense of our sexual selves, right? That though I no longer agreed with its teachings, I was unable to escape them. My body still reacted to sexual thoughts with anxiety, right? My body still reacted to even the possibility that I might consider having sex with my long-term boyfriend with fear so great that it became almost paranoid-like, right? My body mm. still reacted to when I was able to have a positive sexual encounter with um, shaming and self-blaming and judgment um, afterward, right? And ultimately what I discovered was that though I was now in this secular world, right, I was not the same as my secular peers who had been raised in a very different kind of culture and a very different kind of community. And I spent, you know, about six years trying to really work that out on my own. And it wasn't until I started to reach out to my childhood girlfriends from the evangelical church that I, you know, had officially left, but I still had a lot of ties to, and to tell them what I was experiencing, that I started to understand how big this was. Because the wild thing was, is that even those of them who did everything exactly the way that they were supposed to do, who followed the formula to a happy, healthy life that we were given, right? We're actually experiencing the same things I was. So many of us were plagued yeah. by an overwhelming sexual shame, fear, and anxiety that often manifest in our bodies in ways that mimicked PTSD, whether we were you know, still in the church or had left, whether we were single or partnered, um, whether we were you know, uh, straight or members of the LGBTQIA community, and so on and so forth, of all the different ways in which our lives made us um, begin to be different from one another as adults, right? We found that our shared experience as girls meant that our inner lives were still startlingly similar. Man. <laughs> and that, was the beginning. that was the beginning of these two decades, you know, almost, not quite two decades, right? But, um, but you know, that's when the research started. The, the moment that I realized I'm not alone, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and then I said, how mm -hmm. many of us are there? <laughs> and the answer oh, is yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that was one of my biggest uh, realizations reading your book um, the, for the first time was realizing I was not alone mm -hmm. was huge. Mm -hmm. and it was so important. And it sparked a lot of conversations um, between me and my husband, between 
me and my friends um, who had also grown up in purity culture. Um, I think that's such an important piece of it is it's not just one off here or there. It's it's everywhere, um, especially in the evangelical space. And so that was huge for me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I really valued from your book is the fact that it comes from your own personal experience, but also has so much research behind it. It, it feels both like almost like a memoir, but also like, um, you know, a, a dissertation. <laughs> and so I, I really liked that because I think that sometimes or oftentimes actually like criti- criticisms of purity culture get written off because it's like, oh, well, you're just X, Y, Z and this is just your opinion or this is just your emotional reaction. And you're like, no, I have all of this data and I have my personal experience and the experiences of all these other people. And so I think it's just such a valuable resource uh, for sort of as a response to purity culture. Um, But I'm curious, like as you were, as you were doing all this research, as you were diving into uh, the ins and outs uh, of the impact that purity culture has had on people, what were some of the really shocking things that you learned um, as you did these interviews and gathered this information and maybe what was what was as expected or like what lined up with your hypothesis as well? You, you know, I mean, part of the reason I think I did so much research is this realization, you know, am I alone that we talked about? Um, I needed I needed to prove to myself that I wasn't making this up. Right. Mm, yeah. Um, it, you know, okay. We, uh, after a year, you know, my first year, I went back to my hometown and I interviewed all the girls that I grew up with in my youth group first. That was the first project. Right. Um, you know, and then at the end of that year, I was like, oh my gosh, I think this is worldwide. Well, maybe <laughs> it's just my youth group. Right. You know, yeah. so, so then I was like, let me do some more. Right. Um, and I feel like there was a lot of, a lot of that throughout the process, a lot of like, um, a, a lot of that conversation within myself of, you know, do I have an ability to see something that others don't see because I grew up in it, right? Or, um, or am I just seeing it because I grew up in it? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the research went went on and on and on. And over time, I think what really was shocking to me was was that that it really was as massive as I. So as, as a part of me said, it, I know it is, right? Um, you know, this, this purity culture that we now talk about that was powered by the white American evangelical Christian purity movement between the 1990s and the early 2000s really intentionally became massive, Right. And ultimately was impacting pop stars in our country and shaping sexual education in public schools here and in countries around the world. Right. You know, the the reach of this movement and the number of people who have been touched is utterly mind boggling, given the fact that most of us didn't even know it was happening. Right. Um, And the number of those people who have been deeply harmed in ways that um, in ways that are subtle in some cases, right? And that kind of go under the radar um, and the person themselves might not even acknowledge until they hear someone else say it. And then they go, oh my God, why, why does that hurt so bad? Because that's my deep unspoken truth for my whole mm. life, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and for other people, you know, manifesting in ways that are impossible to ignore. Like I talked about these, you know, um, these the, people are going to the hospital with panic attacks, for example. Yeah. Right. Wow. Um, so I think that was startling to me. And, and I think it was even more startling to me when the book came out um, and the flood, since the book has come out, the flood of people who have said, this is me and this is my story. And I didn't realize until I heard someone else tell their story and, and, you know that thing that happens where you're like someone just says something true for a moment and, and your your whole body something shifts and you go, 
uh, like it's like a bell is ringing inside of you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like epiphany. (laughs) Right. Yeah. An epiphany of like, that's my pain. That's my Mm -hmm. story. Right. Um, It's been, it's been incredible how many people have had that bell ring inside of them um, because of reading this book or the number of other things that came out um, right. You know, right. When my book came out right around that same time, um, other things were popping too, right? And a lot of things have popped since. So there seems to be a kind of new awareness every day among people. Um, and and I think we're still just, we're still just, this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of, um, of how many people were touched by not just this purity movement that I talked about, um, but, but by the larger culture that enabled it because because these kinds of teachings around patriarchy and um, so on and so forth are are just in the water of our culture. Yeah, yeah. It's like, even as you're saying this, like so many like um, sort of like pin drops on the map of like the way that purity culture has impacted the, our wider culture are just like popping into my mind. Um, and like you talk about like, it's seeping into popular culture. Sometimes it feels like evangelicalism is very isolated and very like contained and people outside of it may not even know what the term purity culture means. Um, But then it also affects so much. Uh, Like I think about an example from like, Uh, us growing up is like the Jonas Brothers had purity (laughs) rings and it was a huge deal when they were no longer wearing their purity rings and everyone was concerned because the Jonas Brothers might not be virgins anymore. Well, in their documentary, (laughs) they kind of came out with how damaging that was for them and how much like flack that they received from either wearing or not wearing the rings and what people thought about it. Oh, yeah. No, that was hugely impactful for them even. Yeah. Um, And so like even things like that where like these are like these you know at the time Disney Channel icons that really their sexual activity should have nothing to do with <laughs> with like who they are as musicians or actors or whatever but yeah. it's still seeped in and like that was that crossover because they grew up in a in a Christian home and um, I think that their dad might have been a pastor even he was, um, yeah. but so something like that or um, even I actually uh, was watching an episode of an old episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians the other day. And the, um, who, uh, Caitlyn Jenner, who was Bruce Jenner at the time, uh, like got really upset because he found out that Kendall was taking birth control pills. And it was like, not even because she was sexually active, but it turned into this whole thing. And like, that feels very purity culture to me as well as this idea that like this young girl, she was like a preteen at the time, I'm pretty sure, like is receiving this like line of questioning and interrogation from her father because she's taking a birth control pill. Mm -hmm. Like, even though that's, like, something that tons of women take for various reasons, Mm -hmm. it's this, like, instant jump to sexualization or to uh, a concern about purity, even outside of, like, just Christian spaces. So it's it's steeped throughout our culture, especially as a quote-unquote Christian nation, (laughs) as people will claim that the United States is, it's like, well, if we're built on Christian values, then we, like, probably also inherit some Christian damage Mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, Christian toxicity as well. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I mean, the only reason that this worked, the only reason that purity culture and the purity movement that enabled it, the only reason that it worked was, and invisibly, like it worked invisibly, (laughs) you know, people didn't even know it was happening, was because it it was very familiar rhetoric. Mm -hmm. It just was familiar rhetoric taken to new levels of extremity, Mm -hmm. right? But, but it's not like, it's not like, you know, when in purity culture, it became um, agreed upon among people in evangelicalism, which was a massive part of our country, right? At that point, 25% of the country, right? Yeah. 
when it became mainstream to say, hey, even dating is a slippery slope to sin Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't date anymore. You should instead court somebody for marriage with the full involvement of both sets of parents, right? Um, You know, when that really extreme, uh, you know, compared to what was happening in our culture previously statement um, became kind of commonplace for a quarter of our country, it still didn't startle people because that's actually, you know, not wildly different (laughs) than how people tend to think about sexuality in general, right? Um, You know, as, as this kind of slippery slope to something horrible, if not, you know, if you're not looking at the world through the lens of sin, right? There are these, these, these teachings, um, you know, were, we're part of we're part of how we functioned in daily life and have been um, for a very 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 long time, and so it enabled you know if that's the foundation right if that cultural foundation was already there see how it shows up on camera try to get those lines straight um, you know then you could take these more extreme teachings stack them on top right and have people not even realize um, so if if the culture at, at large was getting like a dose of toxicity, right? You know, we could then have people who grew up in purity culture swallow whole bottles of toxic, you know, mm. like sludge known as these highly shaming sexual yeah. purity teachings without people even really realizing. Wow, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it even makes me think of um, actually a conversation we just recently had on the podcast with uh, Mike Maeshiro. Uh, he is uh, now openly gay, Christian, uh, like... Leader. Pers- leader, yeah. yeah. He he runs a, a spiritual coaching uh, company, and uh, he has been a prominent figure in, like, evangelical community, especially within Bethel Church. And uh, he talked about, has talked about how, like, the idea of, um, oh, you are uh, gay, so now that must mean that you are all these other things as well. Mm. And it's that same idea of the slippery slope. Um, He has talked about how uh, just because he has now come out and embraced his sexuality, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's, like, sleeping around with a ton of people and partying and all these things. Those are the assumptions people make because they're like, well, if you're gay, then you must also be X, Y, Z. And it's like, well, that's that's a jump, first of all, to make. And that's this weird association that we have with um, anyone who, like, decides to embrace their sexuality, whether that's homosexuality or otherwise, women who decide to, like, embrace their sexuality who are heterosexual even receive the same idea of like oh well if you're okay with this then you must be okay with all these other things Mm -hmm. and it's not that that's not true or that that is true but it's this idea of assuming and then um thinking that you are you're tumbling in some Mm -hmm. way like the slippery slope fallacy just like gets it gets on my nerves because the amount of jumps and assumptions that people make is um, it's not justified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I really loved about Pure uh, was that you did uh, bring up things like the intersections of purity culture and uh, homosexuality uh, and gender and even, uh, you know, like colonialism um, and the ways that purity culture spreads to other cultures, other countries, and also the way that it has impacted people of across the, like the, the spectrum of sexuality and gender. Um, but I'm curious, uh, since uh, you, at the time of writing the book, had uh, 10 years under your belt of, of research and study behind this, and now are approaching 20 years of that, uh, is there anything that feels maybe like dated from the book to you or I even feel like dated maybe is a harsh word but is there anything that uh you feel like you've progressed in or that you've grown in or learned since writing the book uh that pertains to this topic of purity culture yeah um that's a great question so certainly there 
there was a choice that I made, you know, since you brought up specifically the intersectionality, um, you know, there was a choice that I made at a certain point in my research to say, okay, um, I need to have, I need to wrap my head around, you know, some segment of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, purity culture, um, I'm going to look at it through the lens of evangelicalism, um, though, you know, you could look at it through also many other religious and secular lenses. You know, these purity ethics are yeah. go way beyond the purity, um, you know, culture that was established by evangelicalism in this time frame, right? Um, so that was one of the choices. Um, another one of the choices was to focus on people who were raised as girls, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that, um, you know, certainly people have, you know, different identities as adults, but that specific gender messaging for girls, right? Yeah. Um, and another thing that I looked at that I narrowed my focus on for the book was on people who were raised in the white American evangelical Christian purity culture, right? Mm -hmm. So primarily white people or people who were raised within that white culture um, and Americans. And I think that I think that that was a choice that I made for a reason, partially because I felt like there's only so much that I could wrap my head around, you know, um, sure. and I felt like, okay, I need to understand what this sizable segment of the population was experiencing or is experiencing, right? Um, but I've done a lot uh, more listening. I had done up until that point, and I have since done a lot more and more listening to people in these other segments that I didn't really speak to in the book, you know, mm -hmm. and in particular through the lens of race in this country um, and, and specifically through the lens of people of color's experience in the white American evangelical Christian culture, right? Um, you know, different, you know, Martin Luther King once said that the most segregated hour in America is, I believe, 10 a.m. on a Sunday, right? Whoa. We yeah. we tend to have highly segregated religious expression, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, so the reality that the way in which some of these purity ethics are going to show up within a Hispanic community versus the Black church, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, et cetera, right? You know, there are huge differences, right? However, within the white culture and the white community, right, um, there is, and, and that world where those things are taught, this very specific white expression of purity with its white supremacy and its nationalism and all the stuff that's baked into it, right? Mm -hmm. The intersectional marginalization that that results in in the lives of people of color is something that I definitely did not speak to as much as I needed to, right? Um, the way in which it impacts a person to, for example, you know, I've had um, a lot of white women say to me, I was afraid I would lose my purity, right? If I mm. inspired a sexual thought in someone or something like that. Yeah. Um, I've had a number of women of color say to me, I wasn't afraid I would lose my purity. I was pretty clear. I never had purity to begin with, mm -hmm. right? This was purity was reserved for white women. And I was never going to be able to really live up to that ideal simply by the existence of, you know, my body. Right. Yeah. So I think I think that, you know, even with all the choices that I made about what to leave in and what to leave out, um, you know, the, I would have had I to do it over again, really made sure that even within that world of white American evangelicalism, you know, if that was my narrow focus, you know, in this era, <laughs> right. Um, you know, I really would have liked to have spoken to the experience of what it's like to have grown up within that culture as a black person, right. Yeah. Um, you know, or, you know, any number of other bodies that are racialized and sexualized in very unique ways, you know, within our country and our culture, um, you know, racism has sexual components, Right. So, yeah. for example, um, you know, black folks are generally sexualized, hyper sexualized, mm -hmm. even right. Um, mm -hmm. Seen as very, very sexual. 
which is one of the reasons why I think a lot of people felt like they would never really be able to be pure because they couldn't escape their stereotype. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas, you know, an, an Asian man, for example, would be hyper desexualized, mm -hmm. right. Um, you know, a Latino man, hypersexualized Latina is hypersexualized. Right. Um, you know, like, like all of these things, these conversations, none of these conversations are inextricable from one another, to be sure. But in particular, the conversation between race and sexuality and gender, these things are so tightly packed together that I think that I would have, um, it would have definitely benefited from spending more time with how tightly those things are packed and really and really speaking to the 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 differences um among us as well as our similarities right you know the, the similarities that everyone had who was raised in this culture was you know everyone who i represented you know there are some people who walk away from purity culture and say everything is just fine right yeah. Interestingly, those people are often not willing to talk about how everything is fine, right? Mm -hmm. Their sexual life, et cetera, is like a black box, right? Yeah. But, you know, there are certainly lots of people who, um, you know, who have very different stories, you know, and very different lives and very different forms of harm um, and very different levels of harm, right? Um, though we all share this experience of sexual shame, fear, and anxiety, right? Um, so, so anyway, that was a long answer. But what I what I what I'm trying to get at is, I think I could have done more to pull apart the differences, whereas um, you know, particularly through the lens of race and ethnicity. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we're all growing and learning constantly. Like, there's even there's things that we've said in our two years on the podcast that I look back and I'm like, who I don't think that I believe that anymore. I don't stand behind what I said anymore. And part of the risk of putting something out into the the public is that you can, will change your mind eventually, probably about something. And then you're seen as maybe a bit hypocritical or as you had a blind spot or whatever. And like, that's obviously in an extreme form of it. But um I also think there's so much value in you focusing in on one specific uh, experience um, because there was so much to write about that one experience, mm -hmm. you know, like there was so much in Pure, the book that like um, was delved into that if you had addressed all these other things, the book would be like four volumes or something. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And right, so which 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 is part. You know, I do think that you do have to make choices about things to leave out because sure. because my my concern was when I was considering what to what to speak to and what not to. My concern was frankly um, not having a deep enough understanding, um, yeah. and and falling into tokenism or something like mm -hmm. that. Right, mm -hmm. um, you know, or into a surface level, um, uh, you know, understanding that that perhaps did more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I do think, I do think that, you know, there is something powerful about, um, there's something powerful about knowing, you knowing your blind spots, like, you know, so in the book, I think I spoke to, um, I, I remember when I studied anthropology, there, there was a movement within anthropology at a certain point, you know, previously anthropologists would have been expected to be neutral, right? Um, mm -hmm. They're um, observers, they have no opinion, they have no history, they just see the truth, right? Um, yeah. And at a certain point within anthropology, there was this shift where um, people became more cognizant of the fact that there's no such thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you have to actually state, like, here's the culture I come from, here's the world I come from, here are my limitations, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and the way in which I once had a professor describe it was, you can never see the ground that you're standing on, right? Maybe you can see all around you, maybe you can be an incredible observer, but you will never see the ground on which you stand, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, it is important for you to name the ground upon which you stand, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so I think, I think, you know, I think I spoke to making that choice in this book, right, and was trying to really name the ground upon which I stood. And in one chapter in particular said, you know, here are all the stories that, that, um, that I'm going to allude to that, um, that I'm not going into in great depth here, but that deserve great depth, right, which is where I talked more about um, the global experience and about the experience of people of various races in this country. Um, you know, and I think that, I think that now what has shifted for me just to be personal is, you know, more and more the ground on which I stand has changed because, um, I, you know, I am in an interracial family and have been for a long time, but that is changing me and it's changing the ground on which I stand. Um, you know, my husband is black. My older daughter is biracial, um, African-American and Latina. And my younger daughter is Mm African-American. And, you know, the more that I, the more that I live, the more that my being changes via my, um, my being part of a world that I did not have access to before. Right the more that I feel like I feel like I could have, you know, the person I am now could have uh, written with the depth and nuance that perhaps would have been desired or necessary. Right. Um, If that's my job to do, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly don't want to speak for anyone who can speak for themselves. Right. Sure. Um, But yeah, but to your point, we grow, we change. Right. And one of the things that I think is cool about the process of deconstruction is that we were all raised within a worldview in which not only we were expected to have absolute certainty and every answer, right, but in which we were expected to never change, you know, yeah. because, because to change is to say you were wrong before, right? And there's no wrong in evangelicalism. <laughs> Mm. There's no, there's no learning. There's no growing. There's just a mm-hmm. set of answers that you have to agree with at every point, you know, at every moment. If you change your mind, you're wishy-washy, you're lukewarm, mm-hmm. you're all yeah. the things that, you know, are, are berated within that world, you know? Yeah. And those of us who are finding a new way of being in the world, it has to be a new way of being that is, that is softer, <laughs> that allows that allows ourselves to grow and in some cases to your point to grow in public as as um my friend Courtney Martin would put it you know to make mistakes in public to make choices in public that you know maybe have been necessary at the time but that you would love to do differently today <laughs> yeah. you know to um to change your mind to understand, to, um, to, to listen and to be in a different place. It, like this is, this is what the new chapter is about. And I think oftentimes for a lot of people, you know, when we first leave purity culture, um, what we're seeking for is a different set of answers. Okay. So that set of answers that I got in purity culture was, um, uh, you know, I, I accepted, I accepted a binary in purity culture. I accepted that all that was good and the rest of the world was bad. Okay. Now I'm leaving purity culture. I'm still accepting the binary. I haven't accepted possibility that maybe binaries themselves don't exist yet. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to swap everything. I'm going to say all that was there was bad and all that's here is good. Okay. So what's everyone else doing? What's happening in this secular world? Oh, you're doing this. Okay. Then that's what I should do. If you're okay with that. Then I should be okay with that. You know, basically, we sometimes when we first leave an answer system we um look for another answer system we look for another set of norms another set of rules another set of rights and it takes time to really get to the point where we can say like actually (laughs) you know life is really complex and um i'm just going to do the best i can you know, day by day, and it's not going to look the same as anyone else. And it might not even look the same as myself in two years. <laughs> right? yeah. And and that's a very different approach to living. Um, 
and one that and one that I think we were really shamed for growing up, yeah. you know? Yeah. That was a long answer. Please edit that down. Um, no, no, Linda, you are it's getting me beautiful. fired <laughs> up. I love it. I'm like, yes, it is okay to change your mind. Mm-hmm. Not changing your mind is actually a sign of immaturity. Yes. You're sticking to the way that you've believed your entire life. Why is that something yep. we want to do? Absolutely. And the <laughs> like, and getting rid of binaries and like dualism is not a real way to operate in the yeah. world because the world is more than just one thing or the other thing like I just I love it so I'm like you're (laughs) you're a creature me I love it (laughs) yeah um Linda I really love what you said about kind of jumping from absolute to absolute and that's something that I've tried to be very aware of in my own life because if you do the Enneagram at all I'm a one which means I love correctness and absoluteness and um if I'm not morally you know just and accurate the you know the world is a mess Mm -hmm. and so um going from purity culture from evangelical culture from christianity in general of i always have the answer i know what's right i i have looked for that absolute and that comfort uh as a tendency as a human as an anxious human by nature um in other places, in things like relationships or um, p- politics. Oh boy, <laughs> uh, our our nationwide modern religion, right? Uh-huh. Um, which I mean, I've deconstructed a lot of that as well as I've deconstructed from my Christian upbringing um, and conservative upbringing, and. Um, I think that's just something that's really good to be aware of in general. As humans, we crave uh, stability, and that isn't a bad thing inherently, but being okay and at peace with the gray and a little bit of the process and the journey and, you know, like Emma was bringing up, getting rid of binaries, being okay with changing your mind, even though it feels wrong at first, right? Because the process of changing your mind, I feel like you outline this beautifully in the book when you talk about um, oh, the cliff. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. It, it, it's... <laughs> It feels wrong at first, right? Like, you're like, I know this is good, but everything in me is telling me it's wrong. And Mm -hmm. there's almost like a a cellular level of forgetting and redemption and moving out trauma. And that, in my opinion, is the greatest form of Mm -hmm. self-advocacy. Anyway, so I love what you said about that. You're very (laughs) eloquent and well-spoken. And I'm like... I'm ready for that four volume edition of Pure. And along those lines, there's uh, obviously the evangelicalism would like to hold to these, you know, tenets of absolute truth that <clears throat> they purport and that they teach people to believe. And um, and so obviously the contents of deconstruction of books like Pure are going to kind of oppose the common narrative that the majority of Christian thought leaders have held for hundreds of years. And I'm curious, um, how has that reaction or how have Christian thought leaders reacted to your book, to some of the new ways of thinking and um, the deconstructionist thought that you've brought to the table? And what has that been like? Well, I mean, one thing that's really interesting is that I find that many people find it impossible to deny that purity culture was harmful at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, Even people who are front and center, you know, evangelicals who would stand by the ethics of purity culture still, right, will can't deny the level of pain that is surrounding them, you Mm -hmm. know, that is represented by people who were raised in this movement. Um, So so what I often find is that, you know, folks who are still within this conservative culture, there's there's a there's a yes, we do see the pain, you know, but right. (laughs) Mm. Um, And often the but kind of comes around but these are still the fundamental ethics, right? You know, we, we, still, we still believe in a rule system 
And that set of rules still includes um, not having sex before marriage, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, the leap that I would love to see people make from a rule-based sexual ethic to a values-based sexual mm -hmm. ethic uh, is harder for folks who are still within this dualistic um, answer system to embrace, right? Because a values-based sexual ethic is, is fluid, right? Mm -hmm. It's contextual. Um, it's something where the answer isn't always going to be the same. So, for example, if somebody identifies that their values are, um, I want to feel like I am respecting myself and I am respecting, you know, anyone involved in my sexual life or, you know, like, let's just take those two ethics as sure. examples, you know, um, you know, someone might, might come and say, is it wrong to have sex outside of marriage? And I would say, well, what is the particular context of the particular situation <laughs> that you are asking about, right? Um, now, if they say, you know, well, I'm in, uh, I want to have sex with someone who is married to someone else and the other person doesn't know, you know, you know, then when we look at that context through the lens of respecting everyone who's involved, maybe the answer is in this particular case, yeah, maybe it's not ethical according to your values, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if the if the person is um, single and so are you and, you know, people feel no one's being coerced and so on and so forth, then maybe the answer is, yeah, yeah, this aligns with your ethics. But the idea is that you you take the context of the situation and you assess choices via the lens of your ethics and your ethics are not necessarily going to be the same as someone else's ethics. Right. Um, but what you're doing is you're, by doing that, you're baking in a reflection process that is quite frankly, often lacking in sexual decision-making because so many of us, whether or not we were raised in purity culture have internalized so much sexual shame and so much sexual taboo that we just don't talk about stuff, not with any nuance. Right. Um, and we kind of fall into things sometimes, right? right. Um, because we're not taking the time to reflect because reflecting on sexual things, ah, uh, ah, right. You know, like everything <laughs> inside of you is like, don't, yeah. don't look at it. Right. <laughs> um, just let the passion lead you wherever it leads you, you know, yeah. or whatever yeah. it is. Right. Or let the shame lead you or let, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever you're, you're going to allow to lead. So you don't have to look and you don't have to lead. Right. Um, but, but, you know, so this is, this is, this is, I think, a, a really groundbreaking way of looking at sexual ethics, that if we were to actually teach young people that they could make decisions in their life, not just sexual decisions, but decisions in their life <laughs> via the lens of their own carefully considered, carefully selected ethics and values, right? including sexual decisions, right? We would have more thoughtful, more reflective, more careful, more mindful, um, you know, adults. And yeah. um, we see that in business, you know, there, there's a movement to teach business leaders how to make values-based decisions. It doesn't come naturally to everyone, right? Even adults have to learn, okay, before I make a business decision, can I use my values <laughs> to determine which choice I want to make? Right. Um, you know, so if we were to really teach that to young people, um, you know, about all decisions and including sexual decisions, I think it would be a really beautiful um, shift in our society um, and in our world. But, you know, but that is, that is really taboo for a lot of folks who are still within a culture that believes in rules and answers and absolutes and um, and not and doesn't want to hear about context, right? Um, because because there's a sort of one size fits all uh, kind of approach to um, to sexuality, certainly, and to a certain extent to life um, that is hard for people to break. Yeah, and I think we've talked to a lot of the discussions around purity culture, sort of 
deny any space for conversation about emotional intelligence mm-hmm. and mutual respect and consent consent and things like that. And so um, we were talking just recently about how oftentimes the church will blame premarital sex on any marital issues mm-hmm. afterward. But they'll often, blame premarital issues on premarital sex. Well, or marital post-mar- issues. Yeah, marital issues you on gotcha, premarital gotcha. sex. Like, oh, well, one of you had premarital sex, and so trust yeah. was broken or whatever. And oftentimes, it completely denies the fact that maybe the reason trust was broken is because consent wasn't fully understood in that conversation, and mm-hmm. so one person took advantage of the other, or um, even people who do wait up until marriage now are trying to walk into a marriage and they don't have that sort of mutual respect understanding. So uh, there's a lot of, um, I would say, general ethics that kind of just get forgotten. Like we don't talk about ethics in in the church. We talk about what's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And like the the principles that guide them are not always at the forefront and I would say are rarely at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Linda, one of the things that really impacted me in the book is all the way at the end. Um, I cried many times throughout reading your book, but probably the most towards the end because you, you're having this conversation with your mom. And uh, I mean, how sacred are our relationships with our mothers, but also so complicated. Um, and you really end the book with you and your mom having mutual respect but not really being on the same page. And I'm just really curious, like, has that changed at all? How has that evolved? Do you feel comfortable speaking to where you guys are at now? Yeah, that was one of the most meaningful parts for me personally in the book, too. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and I think, you know, you said it well, right? These, These relationships with our family, even for those of us whose families are very problematic, right? There's so much held in them, right? Um, And I think for a lot of people, that ends up being a chapter that really speaks to them because what we're doing when we challenge the things that our parents, and in my case, my mom, gave as what she thought was a gift, right? Um, You know, is we're, we're separating from from a person who, whether or not we feel like we want to be close to them as adults, a part of us, right? That yeah. that child, that inner child still yearns for their closeness and their approval, a closeness that really only comes for many people when you feel like you look at the world the same way. Um, and I love my mom. And it was really, really hard to contend with separation Mm -hmm. from her via the lens of looking at the world differently, right? Um, I really wanted that to not matter. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it really stood, it really stood in this big block between us for a really long time. Um, And you know, I appreciate that she, unlike some other folks in my family, was willing to have the conversations with me mm-hmm. over and over, year after year, decade after decade. And yeah. I do think that we are in a different place today. I don't think that we um, agree on a lot of these points, but it's not the block between us that it once was. And I think that that is in part because my mom has made peace with um with that in a way that I had already made peace with that. I was fine with us having different perspectives. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. <laughs> she wasn't right. Yeah. Um, and now she is something has changed. And, and part of what changed it was actually the release of the book. Um, once she really saw everything that I had to say, mm-hmm. she was not as terrified by it as she had been previously. And I love this story. Um, it, you know, she tells me, she told, she told me that, um, so in my community, right, that my mom and dad still go to the evangelical church. And um, so there are people who within that world who, um, you know, certainly see what I am doing as quite horrific, you know. Yeah. So one day my mom was at the grocery store 
And this woman came up to her, um, the mother of a, of a young person that I grew up with, went up to my mom in the grocery store and said, oh my gosh, I just, uh, I just wanted to say, I am so sorry to have heard about Linda, you know, oh, <laughs> and like, oh, you must be so upset, you know? And my mom told me the story, like she was so proud of herself. Right. And she said, she said, and I said to her, you know, I don't agree with everything that is in Linda's book, but it's not that bad. <laughs> like she had like really had my back you know oh, <laughs> it's what not a key. that bad <laughs> and I and I think that you know that's sort of where we're at now and it yeah. has taken yeah. a really long time to mm. um to get to the point where she can say I don't agree with everything that's in her book but it's not that bad <laughs> 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 wow and so, you know, so I appreciate, I appreciate that, um, that it, that it no longer feels like, like a gigantic block between us. Yeah, that's really good. And how, what a proper Christian response, you know, <laughs> um, with like a little bit of spice, with like a little bit of sass. And I understand in the moment that probably felt really high stakes uh, yeah. and like a really, really big deal. Um, what a sweetheart and like how like precious. <laughs> and I, I love that you guys have been able to like work through some of that. I think that is some of the things I'm navigating now in my own life. And um to see someone like you and be like, it gets better. I'm like, oh, okay, it gets better. <laughs> yeah, um, I that's mean, really keeping, reassuring. Keeping discourse open, yeah. I feel is so essential. Like, yeah. if, it, if, if the person is willing to do it with you in a respect, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, sure. absolutely. Like, I just think that's, that's so precious and valuable. Like, I actually think about... Um, a guest that we've had on twice actually now, uh, her name's Megan Shant. She runs the podcast Faith and Feminism, and she's talked a lot. If Yeah, she, uh, she's talked a lot about um, how she and her husband have had to cut a lot of ties between her and him and uh, his parents because they refuse to have respectful conversation about all these things that they are dissecting and going through so it's it's so beautiful that you and your mom have been able to maintain respectful dialogue and um are able to walk in disagreement but still like so much love and respect mm -hmm. but it's so real like yeah. stepping out into that void or off the cliff or mm -hmm. however the analogy goes the question of it, am i good mm -hmm. you know like so much of the evangelical upbringing revolves around that. Like, am I good? Do, am I close to God? Does he still love me? Like, mm -hmm. and that resonated so strongly with me is just this idea of like a parent's approval being so closely tied to that like core question that I think so many of us have. Yeah. Um, and kind of being able to sort of internalize that for yourself and um, be able to like walk alongside your relatives or parents or people who are close to you who may not necessarily see the same, see things the same way, but being able to for yourself like answer the question, um, which at the beginning of the step off of the cliff is such a tender space to mm -hmm. be in um, for so many people. But yeah. that resonated a lot with me. Yeah, for sure. All of that being said, we've done. You know, we've talked about 10 years of research to create a book. There's been 10 years since. Um, I'm so curious, Linda, what are you doing next? Like, what's on the horizon for you? Do you plan to write another book? Is there going to be a four-part series? <laughs> <laughs> what are you up to? I mean, I know you're counseling people through their deconstruction process and periculture and helping so many people get through what is a true grieving process in a really tough time. So I'm curious, like, what you're up to. You're kind of catching me um, in a long liminal uh, period, it feels like. Um, you know, there is so much work still to be done on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, certainly via the coaching, I've been moving more into healing and solution, right? If the book primarily focused on what's the problem, how does it show up in our lives, right? These days, via the coaching and the nonprofit, I work on what's the healing what's the solution how do we recover mm -hmm. and um and so that that is something that i think will 
be packaged in some way, shape or form, you know, at some point, right. Probably via the break free together nonprofit. Um, but you know, the, the, it has been life giving for me to continue this work via a new lens, right. Via the lens of how we get over, right. Of how we let go of how we recover of how we change of how we heal. And, um, so that is certainly a, a big, part of my life right now. Um, and I also am, uh, I think that there is a, a new sort of um, deep dive into the next, you know, big area to explore, you know, mm -hmm. um, that will go further than purity culture. Although I think that um, all these things are, you know, for me, this is such a major part of, of my um, existence, right? Yeah. Um, that gender and sexuality and who we are and these types of questions that are so central to purity culture, um, uh, deconstruction and reconstruction, you know, whatever I do next will still certainly be um, related in some way. Um, so I've been taking a lot of notes on on the what's next. But, um, but in the meantime, uh, you know, everything is very up in the air in my life right now. You know, we... Um, uh, our daughter was born at the top of the pandemic and we mm -hmm. have spent, uh, you know, the last two years trying to figure out like, what does life look like for us now? Yeah. Um, you know, like right now you're catching me living in Denver for, I'm not sure how much longer, um, all of our stuff is in New York city in storage. And we're kind of exploring like, like what is, where does, where does live, where are we even going to live? Right. Like where yeah. does, where does this family <laughs> thrive? Right. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so yeah, so you're catching me in a, in an in-between and we'll see, we'll see how it all yeah. unfolds. I love that. And I love just the continued like the process of healing. And I think that's kind of the next step after pure is like, we sort of deconstructed all of the things that we grew up understanding to be true and maybe didn't have words for, but pure kind of, you know, lines it out so specifically. And then the next mm -hmm. step of that is like, okay, we, we go through the grieving process and we, we start a journey of healing and we find, um, we find how to get out side of that dualism, you know, instead of switch flipping the switch and hating the church and loving everything else, you know, we're finding that, that space where we can see the good and, and the bad, um, in all things. Um, and it's a long, complicated, beautiful process, but you know, keep us posted. Yeah. <laughs> you, will. You, will. you got it. Yeah. And I definitely, I definitely, um, I definitely think that there's, there's a lot of like juice, you know, in this process of, um, of what is life you know, on the other side of an answer system. So yeah, mm -hmm. lots, lots more to, to dig into there. Love that. Love. So I wanted to give you some time to, um, before we close, because I know we're running out of time, to answer the question um, that we ask all of our guests. It's open to interpretation and those who listen to this um, know this question well. But uh, for you, Linda, what does the phrase woman being mean to you? Yeah, one of the things that strikes me when I hear that question is how much as a girl I disliked the word woman. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if you all felt that way, but I, I feel like I learned growing up that to be a woman was a bad thing. Um, you know, girls were talked about as sugar and spice and everything nice, right? Um, we were sweet, we were non-sexual, we were, um, you know, not causing problems. We were, had this lovely childlike um, uh, naivete and charm and ch charisma and playfulness, right? And women, I felt like, were really talked about via what I now think was probably what, how people were describing feminists, right? Like yeah. I remember thinking like a woman had, like a woman was the the thing with the big shoulder pads and mm. the brash, the brash, um, you know, insistences and the weary eyes. Right. Um, and I remember growing up feeling like I wanted to remain a girl, <laughs> Um, and probably prolonging my girlhood 
you know, longer than was appropriate. Like I, like I remember, I remember, you know, my friend and I, and a, a lot of my friends from the church, I think experienced this, I call it eternal girlhood, right? Um, a lot of us growing up within my youth group were like, you know, blowing bubbles in the park as teenagers, right? And like, mm-hmm. like there was this sort of like grasping at the last remnants of good, you know, wow. like, let me hold on to this stage of life in which I am not the horrible thing that you despise and that I have learned to despise, right? Yeah. Um, by, by like, you know, playing in a sandbox when I'm far too old to be, <laughs> right? mm. <laughs> or yeah. whatever it is, you know? And then uh, I got really, really sick. And, and you all read the book, so you know this. But I got mm. really sick my first year of college and was, over the course of a year and a half, underwent a lot of surgeries and nearly died many times and mm. had an ileostomy bag for a year, which if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's when your intestines literally stick out of your body and you attach a bag to catch all of your waste. Um, you know, and like for a year, right. Um, and the stories I could write a whole book just about, about that era, right. What it is for my, um, to be deconstructing and for my sexuality to be budding while also having an early back. (laughs) But like, but, but my point is this, my point is this, like, I had experienced some tough stuff in my life up until that point, but in that year and a half, I felt like I grew up in a way that was irreversible. Mm. I had seen hardship, right? In a way that, in a way that so many people couldn't understand, right? Um, And I remember, I remember having this realization, like, oh, I'm an adult now. Like, I'm a woman now. This is what it, this is, this is what it feels like. It feels like having seen, (laughs) And having been and having um, survived, right? And being weary and being wise and knowing, knowing things, <laughs> right? Um, and I, and I, so that, that was for me a really important part of my deconstruction. It was the deconstruction of what it meant for me to be a woman. It, in that moment, I went from thinking that being a woman was something that I should avoid at all costs to feeling proud and strong and solid that I was a grown ass adult, you know, and that a lot of the guys I was, you know, surrounded by who were supposed to be better and wiser and leaders and et cetera, et cetera. They didn't know. They didn't, you know, I had been through things that they couldn't even imagine. And a lot more in my life, too, that I don't talk about in the book. Mm-hmm. You know, I was in that moment claiming that I was, I was something stronger than the girl I tried to be. And I could try to deny that as long as I wanted, but it wasn't true. And I wasn't going to try to deny it anymore. But this is who I was. I was a woman now. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. That is um, such a lovely picture of kind of embracing woman being, um, stepping into her fullness Mm -hmm. um, and all the pieces of that. So, um, yeah, I just love your interpretation of that. Yeah. And like the idea of reclaiming a term that was formerly tainted or soured Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by all of these negative connotations that come with woman or yeah. feminist or whatever. That's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the grit, the yes. grit that comes with being a woman. Like I have I've seen, seen shit, shit <laughs> that these men could never imagine. So step off, you know, calm down. Um, and I think there is a, a good lot luck of that trying too. to lead. Good luck trying to lead me. What have you seen? What are you? Seen? Oh <laughs> yes, I love that. Like big quotes on a t-shirt. Need it now. Um, <laughs> that was really good. That's amazing. So um, as we close, Linda, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share any resources that you uh, to first of all plug away. 
um, your own Instagram account or things, ways that people can find you, hear from you, and then also any resources you'd like to share for people who are um, deconstructing purity culture or in the deconstruction space or any of that? Well, certainly if you're interested in coaching or in getting involved in Break Free Together, you can find that on my website, which is my full name, uh, Linda K. Klein, K-A-Y is my middle name, uh, dot com. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I feel like at this point there is so much out there mm -hmm. that uh, that I, I, I get a lot of requests for resources that... Um, where people will write me and I'll be like, well, what are you, what are you dealing with? Right. Because there is such a spectrum of things out there that it's hard to say exactly what's going to be useful for each person. Um, probably the most useful book that I recommend for people when they're exploring sexuality coming out of purity culture uh, is come as you are, which I think is an incredible uh, resource and tool, especially if you're raised in purity culture, but not exclusively if you're raised in purity mm -hmm. culture. Um, so that's probably the book that I recommend the most often. Um, but yeah, but feel free to send me a, a direct message on Instagram with the specific stuff that you're looking at because there are a lot of resources out there these days. Love that. Love it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Linda. Again, it's an honor to have you on. We've been dreaming about having you on for a long time and, um, reading your book was impactful to all three of us. And we have had such great conversations that have stemmed from it. And so um, in so many ways articulated the experiences that um, I lived through. And so uh, it's, it's been huge to, to, to hear, to hear that I'm not alone, mm -hmm. to hear that um, I am good, all of those things. So um, yeah, thank you so much. And um before we wrap up, woman beings, thank you for listening today. Um, as you know, you can find us um, on Instagram at woman being podcast. Um, we are also uh, on all podcast platforms pretty much. Yeah. And if you find one that we're not on, let us know and we'll get on there. <laughs> and, uh, we're also on YouTube. Please subscribe, like, and interact with us because um, a lot of our podcast topics of late have actually come from you, the listener giving us recommendations, sending us um, uh, recommendations for guests. And um, we really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. And also just love the dialogue and the back and forth. So um, with all that being said, I guess we can close today. So thanks, Kelly, Ann, and Emma for joining me. Always. And always a pleasure. That's what I should say. <laughs> Not just always. <laughs> and with that, we bid you adieu.